Hello, my name's Leslie Atherton. This is a piece of writing called Stranger Than Truth. It was during choir practice, the first time it happened, and the pain I experienced was unbearable, a searing, ripping torment that pierced my consciousness. Things are worse now. It isn't that I don't enjoy or appreciate that deep rhythmic rumble from the tenor section which spears me to my soul and gives strength and passion from eclectic melodies and passionate harmonies. Oh no, it's not that. I sing contralto harmonies in the choir, rich and strong and true. I play the cello. I dance a little. But things have changed just recently. My body has begun to rebel against me, to protest and to shiver and shake and fall to the floor when confronted with something it previously found beautiful and soothing. Full seizures have occurred on more than 40 occasions now. Mainly it happens at choir or band practice, but it started also happening when I'm in the shopping centre. Most worryingly, it happened twice when I was alone in my flat watching television. Because of all this, I've had to move back in with mum and dad. Dr Brooks tells me it's all connected to my body's electricity and how the sparks kick off reactions they really needn't. He uses analogies like overstimulation and allergy, but they don't make sense to me. I don't get a raised rash or a runny nose or a headache. I'm in receipt of pain so intense that death would be preferable for those few seconds. I experience a white blue light I can't shield my eyes from because it comes from inside my own mind. Then, and only then, the seizures will begin and soon my brain will sleep as a result of the clanging, ringing, shooting, soaring, searing chords and melodies. I black out, I shiver, I collapse and rise and fall. Dr Brooks tells me it's all to do with music. It can't be, I say. I love music. I play in an orchestra. But he crosses his arms in front of his bulky, white-coated body and insists. Dr Brooks tells me that anti-epileptic drugs would help. Have I got epilepsy? I ask. His arms remain crossed and he nods his head. Seizures of musicogenic epilepsy. I'm sorry, but I'm the one who's sorry now because, in the words of the famous tune, the drugs don't work, they just make it worse. I really am getting worse. And I'm becoming so sensitive that even humming something subconsciously inside my own brain is stimulating the beginnings of a seizure. I'm still a kid, really, but my body has already gone so wrong. It gets me thinking about how we just assume our body will do us justice, will do the right thing in the end, no matter what the odds. I remember some examples, because I guess these things stay with us. They make an imprint on our memories. I read somewhere, and it may or may not be true, about a man from Bellahy, Northern Ireland, who had his sight restored a full two years after he was blinded. This happened when his surgeon carried out an operation called osteo prosthesis, which involved implanting a live tooth root containing a man-made lens into the eye socket. It was interesting as the tooth is the only part of the human body that can't repair itself because the outside is enamel, not a living tissue. I remember that from school. It's also interesting that normal eyes can distinguish up to a million colour surfaces and take in more information than the largest telescope known to man. Our bodies have such wisdom and adaptability. Why is mine one of the bodies to seriously dysfunction, to get its wires crossed at such a young age? Too much thinking. I'm doing far too much thinking about knowledge and brains, but I can't help myself. I become fascinated with unusual others. I read about clever men who wanted their brains preserving for study by future generations. Death is an ever-present risk to us all, especially those of us whose bodies aren't working well. But still, brain preservation doesn't appeal. Nevertheless, I write my will and specify my death wishes. I finish and settle to skim through a scandal magazine. Not my usual reading material, but I'm changing and have to accept it. Despite my ambivalence about music now, I'm gratified to read of a concert pianist whose dying wish was to be part of a stage production of Hamlet. When Andrei Tchaikovsky died in 1982, he left his body to medical research, but requested his skull be given to the RSC to use in their performances. Despite some queasiness over the years at the prospect of using a real human skull, in 2008 David Tennant held the skull aloft 
in Hamlet. I'm glad there was a happy ending for Mr Tchaikovsky, but will I get the same, I wonder? The strong medication I'm on makes no difference. I've tried 17 different drugs, changing my diet, increasing exercise, decreasing exercise, wearing noise-blocking headphones, and even acupuncture and hypnosis, but still my problem is increasing in intensity. I can't even listen to a melodic speaking voice now, and even the rhythmic tap-tap of fingers against a computer keyboard is enough to provoke another attack. Dr Brooks says there's only one other option for this life-limiting condition, brain surgery. It's serious surgery too, which will hopefully cure me if it doesn't kill me. Either way, I'm out of this impossible, soundless, musicless life. I ask advice on whether I should take the risk. My mum says yes. She wants me to get my music back. My dad says no. He'd rather have me as I am than not have me at all. Opinions from my friends are equally mixed. But I have no hesitation. Sitting now on my living room chair, I'm stagnant and unstimulated, unable even to watch television with the sound on. I'm equally unable to go outside for fear of catching a melodic snatch of tinny pop music through the open windows of a passing van, or a fragment of birdsong, or the whistles of the postman. No, I am not mixed. I am decided. The operation shall go ahead.